Hello, and thank you so much for tuning into Everyday Choices Part 1. My name is Margareta Benesek, and I'm a certified climate reality leader and a partnership manager at a marketing agency called Footprint Digital. And I'll be your host at today's events. Now, I know that there are many different things that you could be doing on a Sunday morning or in whatever time zone you are right now, and I'm really grateful that you've decided to spend the next hour or so with us learning about climate science and the solutions. So thank you again. It truly means a lot. Feel free to use the chat if you have any questions or comments. We'll be trying to answer them as we go along. And also, please scan the QR code up here. It will take you directly to 24hoursofreality.org, where you can fill a very short form to plant your tree as a thank you for your time and for your interest today. In the next hour, you're going to hear from eight speakers, including me, about climate change and how we can contribute individually to solving the climate crisis. This is a truly one-of-a-kind presentation, unlike anything I've ever done before, and I'm so excited to introduce to you a group of amazing people who decided to join me at this event. I'd also like to thank my team at Footprint Digital and the whole Climate Reality Project for all their support over the past few weeks, because they really made this whole thing possible, and I'm very proud to be part of this global initiative. The purpose of this presentation is not only to help you understand climate change, but also to hopefully make you feel inspired, make you feel like you can make a difference in your personal life, at work or in your community. Because as Greta said, no one is too small to make a difference. And we need each and every one of you um, to solve this global crisis. The majority of time today we're going to spend at looking at the solutions. Climate change is without a doubt a heavy topic, it's scary, and sometimes it may even seem too big to deal with. And to a certain extent, it is, it's true. Um, we do need support from our governments to achieve systemic change and green recovery as we will be slowly getting out of the global pandemic, hopefully sooner rather than later. But until we get there, we can only do what we can do, starting with our individual actions, our everyday choices. But before we begin, here are a few words from the former US Vice President and founder of the Climate Reality Project, Al Gore. Hello, everyone. I'm Al Gore, and I want to thank you for joining us today for 24 Hours of Reality, Countdown to the Future. As all of you know, we're living through truly extraordinary times. And if you're like most people, you look at these challenges that we're facing now, the climate crisis getting worse, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, structural and institutional racism, the challenges to the operations of democracy. And you ask yourself, what can we do? How do we overcome these truly existential threats that are connected? And how do we build together the sustainable future and the just and fair future that we want and deserve? Well, the presentation you're about to hear and the discussion you're about to join is about these questions. Your host is an incredible climate reality leader that I personally have worked with. And through their presentation, you'll learn the science behind the climate crisis and why it is having such a devastating impact on the ecological balance of our planet. You'll also learn how the climate crisis is connected to the COVID-19 pandemic and is connected to the broader injustices and inequities, not only in the US where I'm located, but in places all around the planet. Just as important, you'll learn that we have the solutions and you'll learn how we can work together to solve these crises, starting with a green recovery and with a just transition to clean energy and the, the technologies that can make our world better in every way. You'll learn what you personally can do to make a difference and to help us create the future that we want and that humanity deserves. So before I hand you back to your host, I wanna say one other thing. Thank you for being a part of this global conversation. The truth of our circumstances is very clear. We have to solve the climate crisis. And we have the solutions we need today. I know that we can solve the climate crisis. We have the political will. You know it's a renewable resource. But it's really because of people like you who are ready to commit the time and energy and attention and stand up and fight for a better world. Because of you, I know that we will succeed. 
Thank you. Now you're finally going to hear from our speakers. They're going to share with you their personal stories and the solutions to climate change that can be applied at an individual level. First up, we have Maxim Gelman, aka Mr. Strudels, the founder of the famous Strudels Pasta Straws. He is saying pasta la vista to soggy paper and plastic straws as they are an easy and uncompromising solution to the single-use plastic problem. In fact, Strudels is not just a straw company, it's a movement inspiring small sustainable changes one strudel at a time. Maxim has received lots of viral press globally and has created a new industry from scratch. He is keen to share his learnings on how to inspire the world to make small sustainable changes to create a ripple effect. Maxim, the stage is yours. We don't need a handful of people doing zero waste perfectly. We need millions of people doing it imperfectly. Just let this thing in. It's a very powerful message. And zero waste, it's just a synonym. This can be replaced by sustainable lifestyle, the choices we make. It's not about that. The main thing is the masses. It's about like getting a buy-in from that masses. It's the powerful, basically intrinsic message in there. There's 7.8 billion people. If we can just convert 1% in the next year to just do something, to just create that little thing, this will, this will create a trip, ripple effect, this create a domino effect, and this is where the change actually lies. And we know it works, because at, at Strudels, we've created a new product, we created a trend, and we can see people love it, people engage with it, and hopefully subconsciously it triggers behavior. So that's exactly what I want to look at today, is just how do we get that buy-in? How can we package it up to make sustainability fun, make it um, applicable, make it actionable for, all the, for, the, for the masses? To do that, I want to explore the psychology of people a little bit, and I look at the obstacles. So the main obstacle is stereotypes. People at the moment, the Joe Blocks on the street is exposed to, in their eyes, extremes. The messages on TV, the messages on Facebook, the friends they talk to, for them it's extremes. Even using a reusable bottle is an extreme for them in their day-to-day -day lifestyle. And that's just the, 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 the tipping point of it. They see all those radical, radical things. They see the bigger picture, not digested them, so they don't, they can't relate to it. And that's exactly the problem. The, this is actually those stereotypes, those extremes are actually what might deter them. They might not want to do anything, so they won't even see those actionable things. Because they don't, they don't aspire to that person that they see. They don't want to be like that. Which kind of brings me to the next point, to the next obstacle. It's compromise. What is compromise? Looking at Google, it's making concessions. Lower than is desirable. Why, like, and subconsciously we all know that definition. So yes, I mean, why would you want to do something that is a concession that's lower than desirable. I mean, like, it's normal. It's a, in someone's nature that you don't want to do it. So I think the, the, the key is to packaging it up that it doesn't, it feels uncompromising. They don't need to do anything. They don't need to change their lifestyle. We need to give them something that is very easy to integrate and they don't, it's seamless, basically. Which kind of brings me to kind of the little, let's call it the theory that we've developed. It's not a scientific theory, it's not, no PhD has been written on it, but if someone's up for it, uh, contact us. Um, it's a funnel of change, kind of adopted, I have a, sale, a kind of uh, commercial background, so it's, a, it's adopted from like the idea of a sales funnel, where just at the end stands a first and perfect action, not buy my product X. And again, this is an illustration, those stages will be different for every person. We coin them something new, that's interesting, tell me more, let's do it, and then that action. But again, different people, different stages. There might be 10, there might be 15. This is just an illustration to just explain the concept that a person needs to be moved through, let's call it a funnel. The next, sub, uh, the next step on this theory, with that in mind, is touch points. By touch points, I mean that message on Instagram or that advert on Instagram you saw, that movie you watched, that friend you talked to, that reusable plate, reusable cutlery you received at work. All those are touch points. And depending where you are in the funnel, it might be very powerful. It might be that last 15th touch point, but it might be the first. But then again, that fir the first one is as important as the 15th, but also it might be that 10th or 11th. It doesn't matter. It's like all those things in sum will lead to it. And then there is the super touch points. So imagine a game of Super Mario. You will basically reach, kind of like find that little coin that gives you three more lives, four more lives. And it's those things, that's how we need to package it up. So super touch points. 
because our goal is to get someone to the first imperfect action as quick as possible because we're running a little bit against the clock with our planet but so it's finding those it's packaging it up because i mean those super touch points is going to accelerate people through that funnel and anyways when they reach when they go through it once they're going to be more open to it because they're going to associate kind of um, all those touch points with fun with, with very easy to implement so it's finding those super touch points I compare it a little bit with like the um, ladder and snake game. So basically 100 is our action. So you roll the dice, well, let's say you hit three. This is a super touch point. It gets you to 39, but then there's also a danger. You might hit a point where then the, you have to go down on the snake. You might be exposed to, again, something extreme and you're just in the wrong mindset. Suddenly you lost someone through the funnel. But again, it's worth it. It's like it's finding those ladders and getting someone to 100 in no time. And that's the way we can then create the triple effect, the domino effect that will make a difference if we get enough of, of the people. So a little bit on the psychology and like trying to understand how to create or how to find those touch points to, to basically get all those masses involved. No compromise to be covered. We know it needs to be something that's not compromising to life. Let's look at fun. There's multiple ways to get a message across. You can do the Uncle Sam, the planet needs you, very up, very upfront, very direct, very salesy, very preachy. And you can do that. My reaction when I see people using plastic straws. It creates fun, it creates happiness, you want to share it, you want to show someone, you're going to laugh. And that's exactly what you want, subconsciously, you've kind of maybe, at super touch point, we've moved you four or five points across, because now suddenly in your head you associate sustainability with fun, and that's exactly what we want. And then there's the next one, the secret sauce, and to be even honest to myself, like that's something I've kind of probably only understood now, preparing that, that talk for you guys, is that added value you're getting. So for we, what we saw with, with um, pasta straws, it's basically when people try one, it makes them happy, it makes them fun, it's a conversation starter, it's an icebreaker. Um, it's very, you, if you share something like that on a video, if you share like a cool idea on your Instagram, suddenly you get people to, you get likes, you get comments, suddenly you've, you've gotten that recognition, you've gotten, you've gotten positive emotions, and for everyone it will be different what that added value is, but it's that you're not doing anything extra and you're getting that. I think that's very powerful. So if you can incorporate that, that's uh, a key to it all. Just as an example, um, to illustrate my point, what I came across is that um, stapler stapler. Yes, you heard correctly, it's a stapler stapler. So what it does, it kind of acts a little bit like a hole puncher, um, and, then by and then it twists the paper, so it then staples it together. But it ticks all the boxes. If you get that at work, so you, you have your effect of stapling, um, but then basically it's fun. It's like, like, plus it's a conversation starter, 100%. People will, people will notice that. People will notice that funny looking thing, except, except of that. But then you've done something powerful. You've written the world of staplers, yes. If you think about it, there's quite a lot of sta staples around. So again, it's no compromise. And it added value is, in that sense, like conversation starter, that po like positive, it's fun, it's happy. So think about it. So I want to end again on just like our formula of no compromises, fun, and added value. Just the super, that's, the, that's where the power lies, to create that domino effect. Like just packaging it up like that or giving someone that's not compromising, that's fun and happy, and that's that added value, intrinsic added value subconsciously. That's how we can create those super touch points. So let, let's make a new stereotype that sustainability is fun and it's easy to implement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maxim. Next up, we have Anne-Sophie Blank. Now, Sophie has a special place in this event because she was one of the people who organized the event last year, the event that completely changed my life. We became friends and we also did the climate reality training together earlier this year. So apart from being a climate reality leader, Sophie is also a technology consultant at IBM iX, focusing her work around sustainability and green tech. And today she's going to be talking to you about how much difference can one person really make. Hello everybody and thank you very much for joining me today and thank you Marketa for the lovely introduction. I already spoke at 24 hours of climate reality last year and a lot has changed since then. But one thing that hasn't changed is the reality of climate change and global warming. But today I would like to speak about the everyday, the choices we make every day and how we can use our voices on a daily basis. A lot of you will remember the horrible bushfires in Australia last year. 
or most recently, the wildfires on the west coast of America. This is Norway in June of this year, after torrential downpours. And from too much rain to not enough rain, life on this planet is getting a bit apocalyptic. This is how Edward Munch pictured the apocalypse in 1893. And this is how I feel at the moment. Monk clearly hit a nerve there. So do you feel as overwhelmed as I do at the moment? Because even though we might feel overwhelmed, we cannot let it lead to inertia, especially not with climate change. Simply too much is at stake. And instead of focusing on the negatives, we need to shift our attention to how we can change the path we're currently on. What can we do that makes us get out of bed in the morning for a better future. And we might think that somebody else will do our work, that agreeing is enough, but it's not. Being passive simply is not enough anymore. Our world is quite literally on fire. And very briefly, I want to speak about voting because it is the single most powerful and straightforward way to put pressure on our governments. In November 2019, the UK government has passed fracking. And in all of 2019, the UK generated more than 18 times as much electricity from renewables as from coal. By February of this year, 279 councils have declared a climate emergency. A lot of positive change is happening, but it's simply not enough top-down political change is happening, but it's way too slow. For every couple of step fo steps forward, we take one step back. We simply need more. Therefore, it is important that at the same time, change is happening from the bottom up. We need to make our voices heard. And a little over two years ago, nobody knew who Greta was. Now, She's mobilizing millions across the globe to use their voices and demand change from the bottom up. It all started with a Friday in August 2018, when Greta decided she had enough. She sat down in front of the Swedish parliament. For a week, it was just her. And a couple of months before Greta started Fridays for Future, she didn't have any social media. In her early days, she didn't know how to use a hashtag and all of her posts were in Swedish, and yet, in little more than 110 weeks, she got nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. She was voted one of the 100 most influential people by Time magazine. She's spoken before the UN, the EU and the World Economic Forum. She even met the Pope. So what do we need to make a difference? And there might be another Greta in the room. But unfortunately, not all of us are Gretas. So how can we use our voices effectively? How can we influence others? And how can we enact change? The magic number to do so is 3.5%. This is based on research conducted by Harvard professor Erica Chenoweth, who's argued that nonviolent movements engaging a threshold of 3.5% of the population have never failed to bring about change. She lo looks at examples of the civil rights movement or the women's rights protests to support her thesis. So bringing it back to the topic of today, 3.5% is all we need. 3.5% of the people on this call, in this city, this country, and this planet to speak up and actively participate in protests using their voices, their votes, and their choices to ensure serious political change. Change at the ballot box and change in the choices we make. And we each have a network of 150 people. And biologically, our brain cannot maintain stable social relationships with more than 150 people. It's also referred to as Dunbar's number. So 150 people, that is roughly the size of people we have joining us today. So imagine each of those 150 people influence 3.5% of their network, five people, and they influence five people, and they, and they, and you get the gist very easily we get to a very large number. After only nine iterations, we have London. And let's, let's just take a moment to imagine the impact of 9.8 million people. And I also want to speak about choices. 
Because it is easy for us to think that our impact doesn't count. But with enough drops, we can fill any bucket. If enough of us care and all we need is 3.5%, we can make a significant impact. Each of us leaves a drop every single day. We don't just vote in the ballot box every couple of years. Instead, we, we vote every single day. Every choice we make casts a vote and hopefully adds a drop to the bucket. So together, we can bring it to overflow. And instead of making perfect choices every single day, we need to be more conscious of the choices we make because they cast a vote for the society, the country, and the world we want to live in. And it's hard to see the road of one person sometimes, but it is impossible not to see the actions of everyone. So let's look at the average UK household carbon sources. We have transport, heat, diet, electricity, and waste as well. Let's focus, focus on transport. Fly less. Let's not use domestic flights anymore. It's so easy to simply take the train. Eat less animal products. If you and your family ate one less steak a week for an entire year, that would be the equivalent of taking a car off the road for three months. And probably the easiest thing you can do is switch to a 100% green energy tariff. And these three actions reduce your household footprint by one third already. But probably the most important choice we can make is talk about climate change. And let's not just talk about the science, but why does it matter to us? Every single person has the values they need to care about a changing climate. They just haven't connected the dots yet. And that is what we can do through our conversations with them. Politically, it matters to me because without minimizing the impact of climate change, as much as still possible, it will be mayhem. But emotionally, I want my kids to grow up in a world where they can lead a life similar to all of us on this call, without nature destroyed by wildfires, without animals suffocating from the plastics in the ocean, and without the Maldives or the Bahamas flooded and destroyed by hurricanes. So let's use our vote, our voices and our choices. Let's go out safely and spread the world. Let's educate others. Let's share experiences. Join a climate strike today because it is our chance to make our choices heard. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sophie. Now we're going to hear from another Sophie, Sophie Siegel. Sophie is an impact entrepreneur with a focus on customers. Curious and creative at heart, she is a change maker and innovative thinker who loves to spark the unexpected in people's minds. She co-founded Co-Create Impact to help companies engage their employees in sustainability and the circular economy by using play-based learning and immersive game workshops in an innovative and fun way. She also leads the Circular Economy Club in Reading and today Sophie is going to share some tips on how we can bring the circular economy into our personal lives. If there is one thing I realize across the years is that it always starts with a story. So let me start by telling you my little story. A couple of years ago, I embarked on an adventure to go and run the Uganda Marathon. Now, at that time, I had absolutely no clue on how this experience would change the rest of my life. You see, I wasn't raised by eco warrior parents. I actually had a very traditional commercial car year, and sustainability meant green stuff or CSR policies to me. But on day five of our trip, we had the chance to go and help with a local community project. Our mission was simple. We had to build a wooden house, a wooden hut, <laughs> not a house, a hut, that was to become a plastic collection point uh, and tell the locals what it was all about. So I remember going onto that dirt track, giving out leaflets, and at the end of the street, turning around, and I could still feel my heart actually racing when I realized that the people I had talked to, especially the children, had cleared out the street of over 50 kilos of plastic within a couple of hours. And that moment was really the first realization moment for me where I realized that change, positive change, can happen at speed. And this change can be for the people, the planet, and the profit at the same time. 
And that was a fascinating moment. Now, fast forward a couple of months later, someone mentioned something called the circular economy. And I got curious. And at that time, I realized that actually, this is exactly what had happened in front of my eyes in Uganda. Those rubbish plastics bottles that we were collecting were then being shredded into small particles and then being made into tiles. And those tiles were to be used to build the infrastructure of the roads in Uganda. That was the circular economy. And at the same time, I somehow rewatched The Lion King with my kids. And there is a theme there that really like stays stuck in my head. When Mufasa tells his son, when we die, our bodies become the grass and the antelope eat the grass. And so we are all connected in the great circular flight. And this is exactly that. In the, in the nature, everything has its circle, everything has its space. There is no waste. There is no waste. Cool stuff. So just to tell you a bit more about the circular economy, it's quite simple to picture it as a line. In our modern industrial world, we dig something out of the ground, we make something that has value with it, we consume it, and once we're done, we're throwing it away. And that often ends up in our landfills. In the circular economy, you can imagine like bending that line into a circle. And then the products basically goes round and round into that circle, they get being used again and again. And once they stop being used, they are being dismantled and the different materials are re being reused for different purposes. And at that time I realized, I was like, oh, it makes so much business sense. And it makes so much sense to me, more importantly. And that's when I started questioning, if it makes so much sense, why isn't it more present in my life? And I went through a very big phase of questioning. So if the circular economy is about designing out pollution and keeping product and material in use for how long as we can, where could I start to repair more things? Could I start sharing more things? Could I start reusing more things? Once it's done, could it be repurposed and remake as new for someone else? And as the last resort, could I recycle more? And then from the natural cycle perspective, it was like, where, where are there any uh, cycle in my life, in and around my house, that were being broken, that I could start to restore? And this is where I decided that the first thing to do was actually to use my consumer buying power, as we say, but basically to reward companies that were doing something good. And I started renting my jeans from my jeans. So I received two to three times a year, like a new pair of jeans that I can just use. And once I'm done, I send it back, they send me something else, and I stay at the forefront of fashion. I also use Rapanini for my t-shirts and hoodies. And once I'm done, I send back the old t-shirts um, they reuse the material and they give me an incentive to buy another one later on. I started drinking toast uh, beer, which is basically made out of waste bread. And I've started buying things made from recycled material. The sunglasses have been made from recovered uh, fish nets uh, from the sea. And I also thought as a, as a woman, actually my menstruation does create a lot of waste. Uh, and this is where I started using DAME with all the reusable solutions. And now there is a new solution called Loop as well, which makes reusable packaging an option for the mainstream brands. And I've started using it. So that is all from a sort of consumption point of view. And then there was also like the natural aspect, as I was saying. And I looked at the waste, some of the waste aspects, and I realized I like my warm shower, so I cannot start with her having cold water on me. And I realized how much water I was wasting when I started collecting it and then using it to grow the vegetables in my garden. And by doing that, I'm starting in my own house to start restoring some of these cycles. Now, lockdown came and I had a bit more time and I realized that I've got that big, big, big box of repair things that had been sitting in a corner for a very long time. So I took it out and started to try to repair that little hand hoover, which was a total failure because it clearly isn't designed to be repaired. But what happened that I hadn't realized is that it inspired my daughter to start looking at things differently. Since then, she opens up 
everything that you find to look at the design, to find out how it works, and if it doesn't work, to try to repair it. So much so that she decided those two lock her to flat. So what happened there is that this is what I call the ripple effect. So that I change my behaviors, not asking anyone else to do anything else, but people by watching me got influenced. And we all have a sphere of influence. And I really, I love it. Because it's something easy that we don't have to do anything <laughs> other than changing our way of doing. And then one final thing is I decided I wanted to dream big. And I decided that curiosity, looking at things, asking questions like what if or how could, and being playful with it. So I reward myself every time I do something new. Every time I, yeah, I achieve something, I reward myself and then I look at what's next on the journey. So here really isn't about giving you a blueprint of what you should do. It was really about trying to give you some inspiration to show me my journey, my imperfect journey, <laughs> because I'm far from being brilliant at all of it. But this is that. So what would really, if there is one thing I'd say, if you can take from this talk, it's like pick one thing that seems to resonate with you from my talk or from any of the other talks that you would listen to today. And commit to do it. Commit to yourself, but also commit to other people. Go and tell them, you know what? I've heard about that. This is brilliant. I hadn't thought about it. I'm going to do it. Because by committing to others, we increase our chance of making the change happen in our life. And it feels good. <laughs> um, and the final thought is that for me, for the first time ever, going around and around and around in circle makes sense. And this is the thing that will allow me to look at my kids in their eyes like 10, 15 years time and say all the little changes I've made in our everyday life made me be part of the solution, not the problem. Thank you. Thanks, Sophie. I love that quote from Lion King. Now we're going to hear from Asim Hussain. Asim is a developer, author and speaker with over 19 years experience working for organizations such as the European Space Agency, Google and now Microsoft, where he is the Green Developer Relations Lead. He's also host of the Climate Fix podcast and today he's going to talk about sustainable tech choices. My name is Asim Hussain and I am the Green Cloud Advocacy Lead at Microsoft. I'm also a co-organizer of the community climateaction.tech and I'm helping to grow the field of sustainable software engineering and help answer the question what choices can software engineers make to build a sustainable future. So the field of computing is a field of specialists and in order to build software what you do is you gather together a crack team of specialists with complementary skills. For instance, you may hire a developer and a developer's role is to build or to write the code, the code that a machine understands and, and executes. But then you'll also hire perhaps a tester whose role it is to make sure that code is, is, is bug free and kind of put it through its paces. You may also hire a security expert to make sure that that code doesn't have any security holes and can't be hacked. There's many, many, many more different specialist roles that you would bring together to build software. And I see a future where sustainable software engineering is a specialty. So just as a role of a security expert, you would hire a sustainable software engineer to join your crack team. And their responsibility will be to make sure that, that software has been built as sustainably and is as run as sustainably as possible. That's the dream. Now, let me tell you how that dream started. It started with my son, Micah. So I received some advice from a friend of mine called Brendan when he was born um, to take the nappy changes. You know, my wife had decided to, to breastfeed. And so she's going to have that quality time with him. Um, the rest of the time is going to be passed around like a football through all friends and family. Take the nappy changes, he said, because the nappy changes, that's going to be your quality time with him. I thought that's a great idea. I'll take the nappy changes. And a few days later, my wife, and I told my wife she was happy with it, but then a few days later, she told me, actually, I've decided we're going to use cloth nappies. Now, we're a fairly, fairly green family, so it wasn't a huge surprise to me. So, I was, you know, whatever, I'll go, I'll go ahead and do cloth nappies. And the thing to understand about cloth nappies is unlike a disposable nappy, it really makes you confront and deal with poop. 
on a daily basis, on an eight time a daily basis. So you, you get it, you, I got very, very, very used to dealing with poop. Um, it'll get everywhere, I don't mind about it. I don't mind poop, poop, I don't care about poop, I don't mind. Um, so used to it that in fact, like, you know, people, I'll be on conference calls with, with, uh, with colleagues and they'll be like, Asim, Asim, what's that on your, what's that on your face? And I'll be like, don't worry about it, it's just poop. Very, very used. To dealing with poop. But then I had an epiphany, kind of, I think maybe a few months in, where I realized, well, how come I was so willing to deal with poop on a, in a daily, da daily basis? How come I was willing to do that for the environment? How come I was willing to do that for the planet? And yet I couldn't remember a single time in my entire career that I or anybody else had put up their hands in any technical discussion, in any architectural meeting, in any team meeting, and asked the question, well, well, what's the greener option? Never, not once. And that started me on this, on this huge, long journey. You know, I, I, uh, a friend of mine in the Green Party, he encouraged me to, to join ClimateAction.Tech, and, and I joined, and now I'm, I'm, I'm an organizer of that, and I encourage you to join ClimateAction.Tech. And inside there, I found a lot of like-minded people, people who, who are a bit further on in, in, or more refined in their thinking about this space than me, but just generally a bunch of people who were all kind of broadly looking at the same problem. You know, I, I read the, whatever books there were on the subject, there's not many, a whole ton of academic papers, and really just started to broaden up and figure out kind of what is it, what, what is the advice, like how do we figure out what is the greener option? And I realized, actually, we need to, I need to make this easier for the next person coming along. We can't expect them to, to do the same stuff that I've done. Um, at first, I thought it'd be a checklist. A checklist, how naive am I? Um, but then over time, I realized, actually, this is an entire discipline that we're describing here. Now, sustainable software engineering isn't a term I coined, but what I can lay claim to is writing the seminal work, which is the eight principles of sustainable software engineering, which you can find on the website principles.green. So how do we define sustainable software engineering? Well, we define it as an emerging discipline at the intersection of climate science, software, hardware, electricity markets, and data center design. Now, the eight principles of sustainable software engineering are a core set of competencies needed in order to build and run sustainable applications. Now, I don't have time to take you through the eight principles today, but don't be afraid, head to, this, head to the website principles.green. The principles were written so they could be absorbed in about 10, 15 minutes. There's not a huge amount of information to, to take in in one go. And, but in 10 minutes, they won't give you answers. And I'm sorry to say, they won't give you answers. But they will give you the right questions to ask. They introduce you to topics you may never have touched on before. Such as, what exactly is carbon? Um, an understanding of electricity, a deep understanding of electricity. How is it? How is it made? What are the implications of that? What is carbon intensity? What is embodied carbon? These are things that you're not taught as software engineers, but you need to know in order to evaluate software from a sustainability perspective. So in this confusing world of all this information there is out there, the, the, the principles point you in the right direction. So where are we now? So it's still very much in the nascent stages, but it's growing and growing very, very fast. So we've got principles.green, that kind of resource online. Uh, in fact, there was the very first sustainable software engineering conference happened recently. You can find all the videos online on greenconf.io. I was not even involved. I just gave the keynote. That's it. it was, it's growing all by itself. And it started to find its way into kind of policy documents. Just the other week, I found it in, a, in, a, in an EU policy document. Um, by, uh, by Nesta, I believe. And at Microsoft, we're starting the long journey of figuring out how to build software on Microsoft platforms more sustainably. So we're writing content on our docs.microsoft.platform. We have a blog, a sustainable software engineering blog, which you can find on acca.ms, um, sse slash blog. Um, and if I do my job right, in the future, there's going to be certification. So you'll be able to go to Microsoft website, uh, train up, and then receive Microsoft Certified Sustainable Software Engineer. If I've done my job right, that is the future of sustainable software engineering at Microsoft. 
But as well as the eight principles, I would also say there are two philosophies of sustainable software engineering. The first is that everyone has a part to play. Whatever the dis discipline, whatever area you're in, whatever sector, there is something for you here. The second philosophy is that sustainability is enough all by itself to justify our work. In the past, we had to wrap sustainability in these little pills to make it easier to swallow. Just doing something for the sake of sustainability wasn't enough. As sustainable software engineers, we recognize there are many advantages to building sustainable applications. They're almost always cheaper. They're almost always faster. And they're almost always more resilient. But the primary reason we're doing this is for sustainability. Everything else is an added advantage. Sustainability is enough all by itself to justify our work. Thank you. Thank you, Asim. Next, you're going to hear from Dominique Palmer. Dominique is a climate justice activist and an organizer within Fridays for Future International and the UK's Student Climate Network. She volunteers in organizing climate strikes and actions, mobilizing students from across the UK and working on international campaigns. She's a public speaker on environmental justice that is interlinked with social issues and has spoken at events such as the UN Climate Change Conference in 2019, also known as COP25. Dominique is also a student at the University of Birmingham studying politics and international relations. And today she's going to be talking about the youth climate movement and intersectional climate justice. The race to safeguard the future of this planet begins now. We are not only fighting for our futures, but for the present and for those already on the front lines of the climate crisis. Systemic and individual change go hand in hand. And as an individual, you have so much more power than you realize to enact change. By educating yourself and others, by spreading awareness, joining your local climate activist groups to push politicians into action, by taking to the streets, and by even pushing for changes in you, the workplace, at your university or at your school, by doing all of these things, you are taking climate action. And all of us can make a difference. I've Something that I've realised even when I first began as a regular student, that I had the power to make an impact and to apply pressure and inspire others to do the same. And so a choice that you can choose to make today is to join this global movement in pushing for systemic change. This collective people power is something that I have personally experienced in the climate movement, in the youth climate movement, um, firsthand. And, you know, all across the world, millions and millions of young people have come out in force in direct action for the climate by striking various different physical actions and campaigning. When our planet is under attack, what do we do? Stand up and fight back. And that's exactly what we've been doing. In the past year, this has been rapidly accelerating. This rapid momentum that's picked up in the movement has just been incredible. I mean, as young people, we feel betrayed by our global leaders for not taking the necessary urgent action that we need and for setting these distant emission targets that simply leave the next generation to pick up the pieces. And all of these feelings of betrayal, of fear, and all of this energy has been channeled into this incredible movement. To the point where, you know, last September, we had the global climate strike where over 7.6 million people took to the streets for climate action. And this is where my hope from the future comes from. I've seen such young people engaged in sustaining a global movement, in creating communities among us that strengthen our action. And I've seen that intergenerational cooperation. When you're on the ground or like in the midst of it, that is when you truly feel that hope and it's when you really see people power. So whether you join us in organizing locally, nationally, internationally, or behind the scenes on campaigns, Every single part of the movement, everyone has their place and everyone is equally important in making an impact. Climate emergencies have been declared by parliaments and politicians worldwide. And politicians are starting to realise that we are a force to be reckoned with. But we still have so far to go. And going forward as a movement, we have to have true climate justice at the heart of it. 
and in all of the policies that we push for and all of the systemic change that we push for. We may all be in the same storm in this crisis, but not everyone is in the exact same boat. And this is why we have to educate ourselves on true environmental justice. Globally, there is disproportionate suffering from the impacts of the crisis, such as communities of colour, indigenous communities, women and poorer communities. Globally, communities of colour are a lot more likely to be in the most affected areas and in areas where there's significantly worse air pollution. They're also more likely to have fewer resources to cope with climate related disasters. And we've seen these kind of disasters around the world. The heat waves, the cyclones, the floods, the droughts. We are not just facing climate refugees in the future, but people are being displaced now. People's livelihoods are already being impacted. We also have indigenous communities who protect 80% of the world's biodiversity, who do not, who still do not have rights in regards to their land and as people. They are environmental defenders of our natural resources, and yet they are defending their land from grabs from corporations every single day. Indigenous rights is a climate issue. And with women, 80% of climate refugees are women. They face barriers to being economically independent, which leaves them in vulnerable situations. They also represent a significant part of the global agricultural workforce, meaning working in places where the climate massively affects their livelihoods. And discrimination and violence against women rises as the climate crisis intensifies. And with poorer communities, they do not have all of the access to resources or the ability to relocate Globally, air pollution is significantly worse for poor communities. An example of this is something, um, an example that's quite close to me as someone who grew up in London. 80% of schools in London in the most highly polluted areas are classified as deprived. And globally, poor communities deal with labour exploitation in regards to our natural resources. To limit global temperatures below 1.5 degrees Celsius, we need to end exploitation of our supporting life systems and of people. These are all incredibly important things to remember if we are to mitigate for these communities. So we have to unify this struggle and realise how all of these different social issues link. If we are to achieve a just and prosperous transition to a zero carbon economy that we need, we must have true intersectional environmental justice. So please join us in applying pressure, in spreading awareness and growing this global climate movement for bold and systemic change that we so desperately need right now. And join us in platforming the voices of those communities who are being disproportionately impacted. Time is running out. But right now we have the choice in how we utilise that time. Thank you. Thanks, Dominique. Next up, we're going to hear from Mark Said, the founder and CEO of the UK-based firm Safe Money Cut Carbon. Mark is known as a disruptive entrepreneur as his experience is in business which move new technologies into the mainstream. Safe Money Cut Carbon is his latest venture founded in 2012. The company has enjoyed rapid growth and is recognized as the trip advisor for sustainability. Today, Mark is going to talk to us about how we as consumers can use energy more sustainably to keep the light on. So what happens one day when we go to push the light switch and the lights don't come on? I'm Mark Say, and it's a pleasure to be speaking to you today. Uh, I want to give you a little bit of background of my background, and I want to start by kind of actually bringing forward a bit of a confession. I'm not a green champion. I never strapped myself to the tree when the builders came. I used to like uh, my fast cars and I've owned a few. I like to jet away on my holidays. And in my previous corporate and entrepreneurial world, I used to look after 20 countries. I was the man that could boast that I could visit three of my countries every week. But it was one, on, one of those journeys when I was flying in America that I went to a futures meeting. And that futures meeting got me thinking, and the business I run today is an output that initial spark, that thought. And I remember 10 years ago, sitting in front of a presentation where someone presented to me and said, by 2020, 
2019, 2020, there will be people rioting in the streets over this thing called carbon. And 10 years after that, in 2030, one of the major conflicts in the world will not be over energy and oil, but over shortage of water. This is how I started my journey into energy, water, and carbon reduction. Fast forward 10 years, the team here at Save Money Cut Carbon is really focusing on what I want to talk today about, which is demand side in the carbon reduction story. We call the business Save Money Cut Carbon because everybody, we believe, wants to save money. We all know what £25 looks like off our monthly home energy bill. We all know if we're running a business what a £1,000 looks like to the bottom line. But do people really know what a tonne of carbon looks like? I would question that. I always talk about five double-decker buses at room temperature, but I'm sure watching this today there's many more experts than me that will be quick to write in and tell me I've maybe got that slightly wrong. The key, the key of what we do is the word demand. It's about demand side management. Where we seem to be focused globally at the moment on supply side. Even this week, Boris Johnson has announced more windmills, more solar panels, generating more energy. And I want to talk today about thinking about how we use less of the energy that we actually produce. Whether that's come from a really great renewable sources like wind, like solar, or dare I say again to upset people, it's come from nuclear and fossil fuels, because we need it all if we're going to keep the lights on. I believe we're heading to an absolutely perfect storm. If you look at the National Grid's report on the future energy needs of the UK, they're talking about the wattage requirement we need across the UK doubling in the next 10 to 20 years. On the supply side, we have an ageing network of traditional power stations, nuclear and fossil fuel coming to their end of life. Building new power stations is a long-term gain. It's a long-term story that needs a very long-term vision. If you look at our infrastructure spend at the moment in the UK alone, we are starting to look at nuclear, but nobody really knows whether the nuclear power stations are on track, off track, I understand some of the first ones are already years behind schedule and a billion over budget. Nobody can really work out whether the French, the Chinese, or whoever owns the future generation of our energy and our security here in the UK. If you then overlay our own carbon reduction policies, we're all going to be driving electric cars. We're all going to be heating by electric. So we've got a combination of lots more devices, lots more consumption, and our supply side really, really struggling without a long-term vision of how we're going to generate all this energy. Put that together, and I believe we're heading for a perfect storm. And maybe next time we push the light switch, the lights may not come on. But come with me, and let's look at uh, demand side in action. So we're here in what we call the Sky Garden, our Learn and Save Lab, where we are forever testing new technology and inviting customers to come and look at some displays and uh, engagement to really get them to think about the demand side in their homes and their buildings. So we've got everything from motors to how we can reduce water rates. To, and obviously when we think about water flow rates, we're also talking about the energy that's being used to heat and pump that water. But we're going to start with something really, really basic, the traditional old fashioned light bulb. So we talked about demand side and how can we impact the UK's power infrastructure? How can we reduce less so that we've got more energy available to do the things that we want to do in the future, like charge our electric cars? This is a really simple demo. I've got here a typical uh, 60 watt light bulb. I'm going to screw it into this very simple test device just to demonstrate what this really looks like. Everybody knows about LED light bulb, but do you really know what the savings look like? in pounds and pence. So we're going to turn this light bulb on now. You can see down here just over 60 watts, 62.4 watts, but more importantly at 11 pence uh, per unit and on 10 hours a day the price to run that single light bulb per year is round about 25 pounds. Now I'm going to change that light bulb for an LED. This is one available from Save Money Cut Carbon but other retailers are available. We're going to plug the same light bulb into a little device here can turn the same light on, same output. You can now see just under four watts, but most importantly, look at one pound fifty-six to run that light bulb. 
So we've just reduced the energy consumption from a demand side point of view down by around about 90%. But more importantly, we talked about people understanding money saving rather than carbon. We've taken that money reduction down from 25 pounds per light bulb down to just under two pounds. So let's conservatively say a saving around about 20 pounds per light bulb per year. Now let's just be a little bit controversial here and look at the 13.5 billion pounds that's been spent so far on smart meters. The cynic may say smart meters is all about helping our energy companies supply side once again, simply get their bills in faster, reduce their headcount and make their billing systems more profitable and automated. If you look in Google and you type it in, they believe now that a smart meter may roughly save a household about £11 a year, assuming that it's on display and they're watching it regularly. I've just shown you a demand side piece of technology that could guarantee to save you £20 an hour a year per light bulb. Now let's scale that up because I can see you already saying it's just a light bulb mark. Let's scale that up to 27 million households in the UK. If they were all given 10 free light bulbs, that would cost us about half a billion pounds across 27 million households, 10 light bulbs each at a couple of pounds per lamp. But we've just shown you the 200 pound savings that every household could enjoy. That compared with our smart meter investment would leave about 13 billion spare. And I'm sure watching today, there's going to be some schools, some hospitals, lots of other emergency services, charities that could look at 13 billion pounds spare and do some amazing things with it. So whether you're driven by saving money on your energy bills or cutting carbon, it's great for us all. And let's make sure that in the future, when we click the switch, the lights come on. Thank you, Mark. Last but not least, we're going to hear from Phoebe Yu. Phoebe is the CEO and founder of Attitude, a luxury brand that offers organic bamboo bedding, bath and sleep essentials that are gentle for your skin and the planet. While shopping for her own home after moving to Melbourne in Australia, Phoebe spotted an opportunity within the bedding market to create sustainable luxury for less. Earlier this year, Attitude was named an Inc. 5000 fastest growing private companies in America. And today, Phoebe is going to be talking about choosing sustainable textiles for your home. I'm wearing a simple cotton t-shirt today. Do you know it takes 2,700 liters water to make one cotton shirt? Enough water for one person to drink three liters a day for two and a half years or enough to fill more than 30 bathtubs. Your favorite pair of jeans? That takes 10,000 liters of water to make. That one person would take 10 years to drink 10,000 liters of water. The fashion industry produces 20% of global wastewater and 10% of global carbon emissions more than all international flights and marine time shipping. Textile dyeing is the second largest polluter of water globally, using over 20,000 chemicals and generating 20% of the world's water pollution. Conventionally grown cotton uses more insecticides and pesticides than any other crop on the planet. And while organic cotton doesn't use harmful chemicals, it uses less than conventional cotton, requires more land and more water. Cotton used to be called the life, the fabric of lives, the same way that all you used to be called the fuel of the future. Now the trend is towards renewable energy. So what are the fabrics of the future that have less impact on the environment. The good news is that many exciting innovations are happening right now in textiles to create more sustainable fabrics. I worked in the textile industry for over 15 years and founded my own startup company Attitude, developing and selling sustainable bedding and sleepwear. I've done lots of research on what are the most sustainable fabrics out there and here are my findings. There are four categories of fabrics I think are the most sustainable. 
some of them have already been used at scale, bring down the cost of production. Um, that leads to more affo affordable products. Some still need more awareness and uh, market adoption to drive the price down. The first category is recycled or upcycled fabrics, such as recycled cotton. Recycled or upcycled cotton is made using post-industrial and post-consumer cotton waste. It is a more sustainable alternative than both conventional and organic cotton. It can help reduce water and energy consumption and help keep old cotton clothes out of landfill. Then there is RPET fabric made from recycled plastic bottles. Recycled polyester gives a second life to a material that is not biodegradable and would otherwise end up in landfill or the ocean. It is almost the same as virgin polyester in terms of quality, but its production requires 59% less energy. Also, recycled polyester reduces the amount of crude oil and natural gas extracted from the earth to make more new plastic. Another material in this category is regenerated nylon. It is made from rescued waste such as fishing nets and industrial plastic from oceans and landfills and converted into textile and copy yarns for the fashion and interior industries. The second category is fabric made from semi-synthetic cellulose, which can be made from wood, leaves of plants, or other plant-based materials. The most famous fabric in this category is tensile, produced from the pulp of eucalyptus trees, which don't require a lot of water and pesticides. My company attitudes, bedding, and sleepwear all use bamboo lysa fabric that we develop using a similar clean and closed loop production process to tensile that recycles and reuses water in the production process. We use organic bamboo rather than trees because bamboo yield more fiber per acre than any other plant in the world. There are also orange fiber made from citrus juice by products repurposing them to create silk-like fabric. Fabric made from the stalk of the banana plant is making a comeback. The textile has been used in Japanese and Southeast Asian cultures as, er as early as the 13th century. The third category is vegan leather that can be made from a variety of food and vegetable waste such as pineapple leaves, scopey, the kombucha byproduct, apple peels and cores discarded by the juicing industry, as well as mushroom roots. The fourth category is synthetic silk. Real silk kills thousands of silkworms to create a small amount of silk. Synthetic silk is cruelty free and easier to care than real silk. There is micro silk a material made by technology that replicates the process of spiders producing silk fibers sustainably and at large scale. Q-milk is a material that uses milk protein sourced as a byproduct of the dairy industry. As consumers, we're buying more textile, but keeping them for a shorter time through more informed and better choices, we can positively impact the health of our planet's ecosystem. The type of fabric used to make every items like your t-shirt or bed sheets will determine how much environmental degradation it ends up causing or the practices that reverse it. The three things you should consider when choosing a fabric are First, the source of the raw material, farming and patrolling drilling impact. Second, how the material is processed, chemicals, including water used to turn it into fiber. Third, how the product will be disposed at the end of its life 
can it be recycled or composted? Next time you get changed, turn your t-shirt inside out and look at the label. Besides the washing instructions, you will see the most important detail on this garment, the material. What is your t-shirt made from? Asking these questions is the first step on your sustainable fabric journey. Thank you so much, Phoebe. That was the last talk of this session, Everyday Choices Part 1. We hope that you found it interesting, perhaps you've learned something new and you feel inspired to also take action. I want to challenge you to continue the conversation even after this presentation with your family, your friends, your colleagues, um, your community. You'd be surprised how many people around you care about the planet and about our future on this planet. So do reach out and talk about climate change. After all, it's one of the best things we can do. Before we finish, I wanted to share the words from John Lewis, who sadly passed away this summer. He said, we may not have chosen the time, but the time has chosen us. And I think that's so powerful and so true. If you think about it, we are really the ones who have the power to change things and to change the world. So do think about your everyday choices and keep asking yourself, is this the most sustainable way of doing things? After you consciously make a better choice once, twice, 10 times, 20 times, it becomes a habit and it's incredibly rewarding. I know it from myself. After all, we make these choices for us and for the generations to come. Thank you so much for listening. And if you've enjoyed this event, please consider donating any amount to Building Malawi. It's a charity our company Footprint Digital works very closely with, and we are currently in the process of planting a forest in Malawi. And it would be fantastic if you could support us. I can guarantee that any donations will go directly to Malawi and to the right hands. Thank you again, and if you're interested in learning more, you can join us for Everyday Choices Part 2 at 4 o'clock at UK time today. Thank you. Bye.